Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. All your hard drives are belong to NSA. But first, spy agencies fund climate research in hunt for weather weapon. James, this seems like a classic sort of conspiracy theory type episode of the New World Next Week. We'll take this article from The Guardian. A senior U.S. scientist has expressed concern that the intelligence services are funding climate change research to learn if new technologies could be used as potential weapons. Alan Robach, climate scientist at Rutgers in Jersey, is called a has called on secretive government agencies to be open about their interest in radical work that explores how to alter the world's climate. Robach, who has contributed to reports for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, uses computer models to study how stratospheric aerosols could cool the planet in the way massive volcanic eruptions do. But he was worried about who would control such climate-altering technologies should they prove effective, he told the American Association for the Advancement of Science in San Jose. Last week, the National Academy of Sciences published a two-volume report on different approaches to tackling climate change. One focused on means to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, the other on ways to change clouds or the Earth's surface to make them reflect more sunlight out to space. A report back in 2009 by the Royal Society made similar, similar recommendations. The $600,000 report, the National Academy of Sciences report, was part funded by the U.S. intelligence services. But Robach said the CIA and other agencies had not fully explained their interest in the work. Quote, the CIA was a major funder of the National Academy's report, so that makes me really worried who's going to be in control, Robach said. Other funders included NASA, the U.S. Department of Energy, and NOAA, that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So another way you could put this and summarize it is CIA funding geoengineering to weaponize weather. James? James, this strikes me as one of those types of stories that provides the perfect window into the insane disconnect between reality and actual reality, um, by which I mean there's the reality we're all supposed to believe in, in which weather modification is crazy science fiction stuff. And what are you talking about? That's that's insane. Um, and then there's the reality reality in which not only the CIA, but other various other branches of the U.S. government and uh, one can presume scientific organizations from around the world have been seriously studying this uh, this idea for at the very least, decades. And again, we don't have to speculate about that. There's ample historical uh, documentary evidence of that that we can find in articles like the one that was recently released on activistpost.com by previous Corbett Report uh, guest Peter Kirby entitled Chemtrails Exposed, A History of the New Manhattan the new Manhattan Project, which is a very, very thorough article going through decades and decades of documents talking about proposals for stratospheric uh, spraying, spraying things in the in the sky, in the clouds, cloud seeding, this type of thing, as, uh, as a way of controlling the weather. And in fact, as that 1996 uh, U.S. military document, which has become somewhat famous, uh, is called Weather as a Force Multiplier, Owning the Weather in 2025. Again, that was from 1996, and there's uh, plenty of other documents like that that have been kicking around for decades. It makes perfect sense that the CIA and every other branch of, of the U.S. government and military would be extremely interested in this technology and would presumably be working on it and presumably in secret because they don't want other countries to know about that research. So why on earth should it surprise us that the CIA is suddenly always so interested in climate change and these ideas and funding all of these projects? Of course they have a vested interest in this, but you're not supposed to believe that because that's crazy talk, right? It's crazy talk that they put in, you know, wacky movies and you enjoy it while eating popcorn, but but are laughed at if it's ever brought up in, in, in polite company, as they say. So you said this goes back at least decades. So we'll include a, a flashback to what was called Operation Popeye, weaponized weather during the Vietnam War. So that's already four plus decades there, James. One last related, I think, sets up our second story this week quite well but it still relates back to the, the weather weaponization. And it's from Zero Hedge. CIA accuses Russia of manipulating the world's weather. So within this report, you see a sort of he said, she said, they're doing it, so we should too, and the back and the forth. So I find that a, a really interesting, again, James, I think is each, each week we sort of lay out 
I think the context, but we also sort of come back again and again to sort of the main big big devils, if you will. And a lot of times, you know, it's the big boogeyman of of the West, where the, you know the great Satan and Putin, and other times he's looked at as a rock star or not. And 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 again, we're 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 left with no real leaders to to look up to. So having said that, James, we'll move to our second story this week, and we'll take it from Zero Hedge. Moscow-based security firm reveals biggest NSA-based backdoor exploit ever. Since 2001, a group of hackers dubbed the Equation Group by researchers from Moscow-based Kaspersky Lab have infected computers in at least 42 countries, Iran, Russia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, Syria, with the most infected. In what Ars Technica calls, quote, superhuman technical feats, indicating extraordinary skill and unlimited resources. These exploits, including the prized technique of creating a, a secret storage vault that survives military-grade disk wiping and reformatting, and it covers every hard drive manufacturer and have many similar characteristics to the infamous NSA-led Stuxnet virus. So, according to Kaspersky, the spies made a technological breakthrough by figuring out how to lodge malicious software in the obscure code called firmware. Folks have probably run into that before, and it's the kind of thing I think novice or average computer users will run into and go, oh, geez, that's over my head. I'm not going to mess with that. So firmware, it launches every time the computer's turned on. Disk drive firmware viewed by spies and cybersecurity experts as the second most valuable real estate on a computer for a hacker, second only to the BIOS code, which is invoked automatically every time a computer boots up. Lead Kaspersky researcher Kostin Ryu said in an interview, quote, the hardware will be able to infect the computer over and over. Kaspersky's reconstructions of the spying program show that they could work in disk drives sold by more than a dozen companies comprising essentially the entire market. They include, as I keep showing you, Western Digital, Seagate, Toshiba, IBM, Micron, Samsung, and more. The group used a variety of means to spread other spying programs, such as by compromising jihadist websites, infecting USB sticks and CDs, and developing a self-spreading computer worm called Fanny. Fanny was like Stuxnet in that it exploited two of the same undisclosed software flaws known as, known as Zero Days, which strongly suggest collaboration by the authors, the authors of Fanny, the authors of Stuxnet. Ryu added that it was quite possible that the Equation Group used Fanny to scout out targets for Stuxnet in Iran and spread that virus, which, as Reuters reports, strongly suggests the extraordinary skills and unlimited resources were funded by the NSA. James, this this has been a pretty massive story this week, and even and, and a lot to go through. And again, like we'll always say, we leave all the notes, we give you all the links, you have to go do more research for yourself. But it's interesting how even in the description, we go from talking about compromising jihadist websites, which sounds like, oh, we're doing it to fight the terrorist, and it's also on your hard drive that's on your desk to hold some crappy MP3s, James. Exactly right. And, and think of that, that, uh, that range of activities that are made possible by these types of hacks. Um, and, and let's tie that in with a completely different story that's also being reported at the moment. Bank hackers steal millions via malware. Talking about the same Kaspersky lab that was investigating what is being called one of the greatest bank heists in history, although no one even knew it was happening when it was happening. Basically, uh, talking about this this uh, cyber gang that managed to uh, inject malware into various banking computer systems in multiple financial institutions around the world, but mostly in Russia, interestingly. And uh, basically, they were able to pilfer hundreds of millions maybe as much as a billion dollars out the back door of these banks without the banks even really knowing what was happening when it was happening. Uh, a pretty amazing thing to achieve. And if you read about how that was done and the type of operation, I mean, this was not just some script kiddies. This was a very, very detailed and complex operation. And we've talked about it before. Let's talk about it again. In this world of cyber terrorism and cyber false flags and cyber criminals, again, the only information we have about these attacks is what the authorities will release about them. And 
again, how do we know that that type of banking heist that was going on behind the scenes wasn't being perpetrated by someone in the NSA or some other shadowy agency like that, maybe in the US or any other agency around the world, in order to fund black black ops operations in, in other fields or whatever? Again, all of this is completely, I mean, they can say that it's some sort of Russian mafia thing or something, but again, how do we know that at all? Um, so it, this just opens up that huge box. And if it if this type of story, talking about the, 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 the equation group and what they've been doing, does anything at all, I hope it at least undermines the faith that I, unfortunately, a lot of people still have in these big tech giant companies that, oh, if you buy, you know, whatever, Western Digital or, or Toshiba or something, well, this is this is going to be sound and safe. No, maybe it has hidden back doors and, and things implanted in it, and you don't really know about that. So if it does anything, I hope it gets us to decentralize a little bit and start thinking about how we have to actually um, start creating uh, our own alternative options and start going with other things that are completely off of the the radar of these these types of hacks like uh, raspberry pis and things to try to create an alternative infrastructure that we've talked about a lot but again that's the only way to move forward with this rather than consolidating all this control in the hands of a few tech giants that are really working hand in hand with the nsa anyway We'll include a PDF, a handy-dandy questions and answers breakdown on the equation group and james even as we're talking about this we're knowingly we're they're acknowledging the fact that our our western intelligence services are knowingly hacking and attacking other sovereign nations but yet two months ago we were all wringing our hands and freaking out about the sony hack and who on oh my god and the, the sky is falling and even today as as we're talking james we've got barry satoro going on television talking about we're going to go to war against ISIS, the guys we funded and created to fight those other enemies. And the fake left is for it, and the fake right is for it, and the fake press is all about promoting it. And I think hopefully in some way we'll try and be and continue to be some kind of antidote to that, James. Let's, let's, let's move to story three. Is how I'll get worked up. And in a way, I think we've continued to try and do good news. And I think that's a way that we distinguish ourselves from, from a lot of the noise and a lot of the garbage going on. So a nice way to, to kick off our good news notes on this week, you can now find out if U.S. spies passed on your data to U.K. spies. So following a landmark U.K. decision ruling certain mass surveillance practices were illegal, a privacy group has simplified the process of demanding to know if your rights were violated, James. You're able to 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 petition the court to to find out if you've been spied upon. Are you going to fill it out? Uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure how amazingly good that news is. I mean, I guess it's a step forward, but uh, I'd prefer to see I'd prefer to see more fundamental changes going on. But uh, but yes, I mean, I suppose we can now at least know about or a little bit more about how we're being spied on, which again will hopefully wake up a few more people. Let me throw a couple other good news next week notes at you. See if you like these better. More Icelandic bankers are going to jail. How about that? I very much like the idea of that. When you look into the story, you find out that it's these uh, four bankers associated with this shady deal where basically a bank was trying to cover up the fact that it was it was trying to do some tr stock tr manipulation of itself. And, uh, and so these guys got about four or five years jail, something like that. Um, each and uh, it's not enough, not narrowly enough, given the scope of what's happened. But at the very least, Iceland is prosecuting its banksters. Um, hey, the rest of the world, here's an example. It can be done. So here's here's some other good news notes, James. Croatia to write off debt for its poorest. Marijuana legalization proposal advances here in the U.S. in the state of New Mexico. And Nestle ditches their artificial bits in their U.S. chocolate, which made my partner Cassie note, oh, God, now I feel so much better about Nestle controlling the world's water supply because they'll throw us some crumbs and tell us they're taking out the artificial bits in their already not free trade and not organic, you know, monopoly chocolate, if you will. A uh, columnist resigns from The Telegraph stating, quote, 
The coverage of HSBC in Britain's Daily Telegraph is a fraud on its readers. And James, a lot of these good news stories in a way are follow-ups and updates to stories that we do follow week in, week out for folks here on New World Next Week. And just the last thing I want to note, it's been kind of an interesting day here in Oregon as we've had our governor resign last Friday, the 13th. And most of the headlines around, or at least on places like Drudge and even from other places like Counterpunch, noted Oregon's governor undone by green schemes. And we'll include an article from Counterpunch called Green Crony Capitalism, Oregon's ex-governor and the green wash grifters. This is essentially where our now ex-governor let his fiance peddle influence within the office of the governor so that she could funnel money to her pet green projects, which, if you know anything about Oregon, is like shooting ducks in a barrel because we're all about trying to be green at at any cost. So I think it's a really uh, an interesting story. And in a way, James, maybe this is something we could probably should probably get into in some other avenue. I see the story of her name's Sylvia Hayes is, is the one who's probably going to jail for taking down, in a way, her fiancé, the ex-governor of Oregon, John Kitzhaber. I almost see her in some way as some type of analogy to the stories we've just discussed in some way. You're taking some, someone who, who sees an interest or a, a situation or something that has real uh, reality to it, that, whether that's environment or, or, or technology or what have you, and exploiting that and exploiting fears and exploiting the money, which is essentially the answer to 99 out of 100 questions. I, I see in some way the Sylvia Hayes story as a, as a microcosm to what we see going on in, in the larger world. And so I think ultimately what we say all the time, it's like, yes, your governments are corrupt, your banks, your schools, your churches – it's all completely corrupt, and the fastest, best thing we can do is to completely withdraw our consent and our actions with those. Watch those things crumble, and hopefully we can build something else in, in its place, James. That's a rather lofty way to end this. <laughs> it is, but it's, like, again, a noble goal, and I think what we have to be striving towards. And let's do it both at the same time, withdraw our consent in one system and put our energy and time into building up the other system. I think both are uh, the yin and the yang of what we need to be doing. At any rate, that is a big topic, and I'm sure in many ways it's what we cover here every single week. So let's continue to cover it. Thank you so much once again for three great stories. I'm uh, looking forward to it again next, not next week. I'm going to be in Mexico. So <laughs> a couple of weeks from now, we'll we'll be back. Thank you again. That's, you know, I think that, and what you're doing, you're, you're going to Anarchapulco. That's sort of, again, building building the things that we want to see. And I commend you for being involved in that. It's It's great that you now get to kind of go and travel around. 